Phillips later in the context of the, the great feminism. Philip Slater was a sociologist and a close colleague a long, long ago of C. Wright Mills, a famous sociologist who was the power elite in the 60s and 70s, quite big at that time, died. And Philip Slater also has passed away now, but he dropped out of academia from a tenured job in somewhere. And then he wrote a wonderful book. Uh, his original book that he was famous for in the 60s was um, Pursuit of Loneliness, which was a very, very famous book about industrial society. But then he wrote a book uh, after he'd been out of academia for years called America, A Dream Deferred. And I think that some publisher followed him since he dropped out and actually he was delivering milk in Santa Cruz. <laughs> Got him milk trucks. And because uh, I tried to invite him to a conference in Columbia, but he didn't want to go. He had a heap of milk and so on. <laughs> and uh, I love that book. But what, 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 I, what I just thought of in the circle is that he said it was a brilliant exposition of how democracy is not a set of documents and it's not just the mere fact of voting and everything. Democracy is a skill, a social skill. And it involves tremendous amount of communication and uh, bonding. You know, that's what I thought of in the circle. And he particularly said, therefore, that democracy requires the empowerment of women who talk and who look to each other and are very realistic and like, are concerned with the realities around them in a different way. And that. Uh, until women were equally empowered in America, he said, American democracy cannot recover, he said. And it's really quite a beautiful thing about, and it, of course it's an analysis and a critique of the television world, you know, and these things that in industrial society, families and people get very isolated. They, they feel they're plugged into the larger world, but they're, they're actually isolated as to what's going on around them. And he quoted, of course, as, as later some other sociologists who wrote that, or Stavros Holmes, too. <clears throat> he quoted de Tocqueville, the famous French sociologist who came here in the 19th century. And he said, the strength of American democracy at that time, which many of the Europeans were kind of doubtful about, was that Americans go to town meetings all the time. They're in the basement of some church, and they're talking about who is doing what on which property. And, and you know, they made corporations are state incorporated, and the state could review them in the original rules every year. If they were harming the Commonwealth, they would be shut down by the state, not the, not the federal state, the state state. And, and all kinds of things about how America's strength had to do with people knowing everything about everybody else and being communicating all the time and, and not a kind of excessively isolated and disempowered form of individualism. And the key in breaking through that was the women, the horizontal relationships that women are excel in forming in society. Mm -hmm. And men tend toward the hierarchical pyramid sort of thing. And then they get isolated uh, on a horizontal level. It's really very wonderful. I recommend the book very much. How democracy is a skill and not a, and it's impossible without the liberation of women, basically, it was his argument. Very, very well argued. I'm sorry, I just wanted to Still ordinary reality, perhaps. No, no, that's great. So, um, does anyone have any questions on anything that we've covered at all today? Um, any question at all? Oh, no, go ahead. Actually, stop my go. I just wanted to ask you what the other book was that you recommended by the um, New Zealander about mm -hmm. labels in the title. Can you just say that again? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Yeah, that is Marilyn Waring, W-A-R-I-N-G. The title of the book is Counting for Nothing. The subtitle is The Labor of Women. And it is a real shocker to read through it. Really it is. You know, especially, of course, in Africa and the Muslim world and in India, China, actually. Although, you know, they, I mean, it's, and even here. But, uh, 
it's really, really shocking. The cover of the paperback is she's standing there. She has short hair, and she's standing in, she's standing in front of a tank. And there's a big the cannon of a tank is coming over her shoulder. She's looking kind of serious. It's a, it's a, it's a excellent book. Very sobering. Because you know, population, excessive population growth, violence, chaos, all come in countries where women have no say. And there's a lot of them. Mary, another question? Well, yes, I, I don't know. I mean, it actually touches, it touches a little bit more on yesterday, but I guess it envelopes in today. Um, the green Tara, uh -huh. <laughs> why of all of the gods and goddesses, why this one specifically for women? Of this, all the Taras, uh, why green Tara? Yeah, like why, why? <clears throat> well, green is the color in the, usually in the green and green black, it's very dark green. It's like a green, like Shyama is a Sanskrit word. It's a very dark green, forest green. And it's the color of what is called the all-accomplishing wisdom, sometimes. Sometimes the wonder-working wisdom. And it is, which itself is the transmutation of the addictive, mental addiction of jealousy. Hmm. And... Um, you know, green-eyed monster, it's, it's interesting in the West, you have that yeah. green-eyed monster. So, uh, so therefore, the green tower, and the green tower is always depicted with one leg crossed, like the cross leg, but then one leg is coming down, like she's about to get up and come to your aid, you know, and got it, quickly come to our eye. And uh, so she, the, the green, the green or dark green or almost black color, um, black and green, represents the ability to get out and change something, so sort of active, dynamic, powerful energy. That's what it symbolizes. When the two first Taras were born in the legend, you know, our, our look at this far as Tiva, um, the white one is the, is the, the white color is the healing color. It's called the mirror, mirror wisdom, a transmutation of delusion, actually, of ignorance. But uh, of the predictive mentality of ignorance. And um, so she's peaceful, Why? she sits cross-legged. She has an eye in the soles of her feet and the palms of her, both well, towers do actually, three eyes in her face, seven eyes. And uh, she's more peaceful and she's involved in peaceful activities and healing activities, white tower. Then there's the yellow tower, who are connected with prospering and growth activities. And red towers are focused on dominating activities, dominion, and uh, power. So that, those are the, called the four kinds of magical activities. So the green one is just very important because that's sort of the quintessence of the tower as, as the incarnation of the miraculous, wonder-working activities and powers of all the Okay, so that's why green towers kind of emphasize. Because I, it, like my map, my rational brain is is thinking like looking at this image. It's very beautiful. I studied art history, so I'm like you know really connecting with it. But I, I guess I don't know how to say this, but like I just really stumble with: is this real? Like, is this not real? Or is this like just to inspire something greater than you know what I mean? Like, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so she's she's saying. She's, uh, she's trying to understand if the concept or the, the actuality of Tara is actually real. Is, is, is it, it more? Is it more for symbolism? I guess. So don't get hung up on the image or the visual, and, and look at it as more like symbolism. Should like she look at it symbolically, or how? Yeah, well, how people can look at it whatever way they're sure. able to look at it, and uh, but. Uh, Tara, I think Tara is real. Uh, I know a few Taras. You might be one. You never quite know. You never know. I think there are supposed to be, we never know who is what. 
And there are supposed to be as many Taras and Avalokiteshvaras in the world as the people in the world need. And, and not only just people, animals also. And every kind of creature. It's the, they say, Gandula Gandul Dela Detamba. Whatever tames or educates whomsoever, that is manifested to that person. So, you know, our tendency, of course, is to think that everyone else is just like us. 